Hey everybody. So this lecture is a continuation of our lectures on mechanical properties of materials. Um, and you will see that for today's slides, um, the objectives we're going to cover are the things that are underlined. Uh, so we already described in the worksheet we did last week, we looked at how to calculate certain properties given a graph. So we looked at calculating modulus of elasticity, yield strength, tensile strength, and additional information from the graphs. And so today I want to cover modulus of, of resilience. I'm also going to cover percent elongation. And then we'll talk about the qualitative uh, comparison between um, the different kinds of uh, properties you can actually get from a graph. <clears throat> so one of the qualitative properties we'll talk about here is um, the concept of ductility. One moment here while I switch this to my laser pointer. Excellent. Okay, so, um, and one of the first properties you learned about the first day of class when we're introducing uh, ceramics, metals, and polymers is the concept of something being ductile or something being brittle, where ductility has to do, if you were to look up the definition, it's how uh, well an, um, a material can be drawn into a wire, okay? And if you think about drawing something into a wire, um, remember this chapter is about um, tensile <clears throat> force on a or on an object, so you're pulling the object apart. Um, if you were to think about it, it's very different from compression, which would be like you know pushing the material together or making it small. In this case, you're making the material longer. So the ductility from a stress strain graph is related to how far out um, that stress strain graph goes. So do not be do not confuse it with the area under the graph. Just think about how far that material um, that length goes. So it's related to the strain um, that the material can withstand. So remember the stresses give us a measure of the strength. So yield strength, um, yield strength and tensile strength are all related to the stress values. This ductility is related to the strain um, value. So if I were to compare AC, for instance, to AC prime, you can see that AC prime is longer, which tells me that um, uh, material represented by the red curve is more ductile than the material represented by the blue curve. Or conversely, the material represented by the blue curve is more brittle than the uh, material represented by the red curve. Okay, another qualitative way to say this is how forgiving the material will be when you try to deform it. Forgiving in the sense that you can almost bend it and uh, you know it can, the material can undergo a lot of strain before it fractures. Okay, so notice that each of these lengths are basically the x-axis of your stress strain graph, okay? And so that's qualitative. Uh, quantitatively, we can actually relate that to the percent elongation. So the percent elongation gives us a measure of um, how ductile this material is. So obviously, if the percent elongation is large, that means the material is very ductile. If the percent elongation is small, that means the material is brittle. And you can calculate that by taking the strain at fracture and multiplying it by 100%. So if you were to go back and look at your expression for strain, you will see it looks very similar to this expression that we're seeing um, over here. One other assumption we can make is that um, the volume of our material doesn't change, which then, if you think about the fact that when I apply a tension, a material goes from an original length to a final length that is um, slightly longer. And what will also happen is that if the volume, if we make the assumption that the volume doesn't change, the cross-sectional area becomes smaller as well. So it goes from this length to something uh, much smaller. And so we can also relate the ductility to what is known as the percent reduction in area, right? And so these two numbers are going to be uh, both larger if the material is ductile and smaller if the material is brittle. The other qualitative uh, property uh, or comparison we can make is related to the area under the stress strain curve. And that particular property is defined as the toughness of the material. Okay, so if we're to look at this three graphs the blue, the green, and the pink even without doing any math, we can see that the green represents, has a, covers a lot more area, the pink covers uh, not as much area as the green, but it does cover a lot more area than the blue does, um, let's say qualitatively, and then the blue covers a small area. So 
the toughness there gives us a measure of how much area is under the curve. And you can think about it in terms of um, if you are, if you go back to what you learned and what you may have learned in mathematics, the area under a curve is defined by the integration, right? Of the by integrating um, that that curve. The other way you can define is that if I were to take, if I were to look at the area under the curve, it would basically be a multiplication of the stress and the strain. And if you think of your stress again as being a um, equivalent or roughly equal to or a measure of the load which is a force and your strain being a measure of the deformation on the material then if i take my force and multiply it by a distance which is deformation force being the load if i take force times distance i get an energy value and so the toughness can also be defined really as the amount of of energy that a material can absorb uh before it fractures because the toughness area covers the whole area under the curve from start to where the material fractures. So um, if you were to look at this, if I were to compare qualitatively the property of, of these materials, I would basically look at the area under the curve and I can tell the material has a, uh, uh, a large toughness or the material is tough or the material is fragile. That would be the opposite of that. So a material that isn't tough will be considered fragile. Okay. And again, like I said, you can estimate this by just taking the area under the curve. So one of the simplest ways you can do this is just to draw a rectangle around that uh, curve. So in this case, for the pink one, I'll draw a rectangle that covers this region and then do that multiplication. That will give me a good estimate of what the toughness is. And so I also want you to go back and think about what the units on that value will be because you're multiplying something here, which is units of stress, by the units of strain. So think about that as far as what you expect the units of that material to be. The next property we'll talk about is something that is known as the modulus of resilience. So the modulus of resilience, if you look at this description, has to do with how much energy a material can absorb um, and then release that energy once you take um, the load off. Okay, So it's sort of related to the toughness. The toughness covers the entire region, okay, up until fracture. Resilience covers just the region up until you have, uh, right before you get plastic deformation, right? Because once you have plastic deformation, that energy cannot be recovered anymore because the material doesn't go back to its original dimension, okay? And so resilience, um, and, and you can, if you, if you were to think about it, these two words, toughness, and um, resilience are kind of related to some words that we talk about in, in English in describing people or describing things, right? If you say someone is tough, um, toughness, sometimes we think of as having to do with strength, right? Which is, if you were to compare for materials, toughness is how high this um, curve goes. But, also, is what someone might think, right? Strength is how high this curve goes. But toughness is a combination of how high the curve goes and how long it goes as well. For instance, this blue curve goes very high but doesn't go very long. That's why that material isn't considered tough. It is strong because that is a, uh, a high value of stress, but it is not tough because it can undergo much strain. Similarly, if you look at this pink curve, you would consider it to be weak because the... Um, the strength or the highest value of stress is low, but then if you were to look at the strain, it can undergo a lot of strain. So this will be a material that isn't that um, strong, but can, you know, um, if you were to use a, a, a comparison to a person, right, it's, it's very flexible in how much it can handle. And so toughness, just to, to, to bring it back to a close, if you're thinking about properties, toughness is just not strength, it's a combination of strength, right, which is how much, uh, stress a material can handle, but also a function of how much it deforms under that um, stress as well. All right, so resilience and toughness, like I said, is 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 there are similar properties, but this, the resilience specifically only goes up to the point where you can recover it, which means that it is only in that region where we have a reversible relationship, right? The elastic region, as we defined it, and so it is related to the area under the curve up until the yield strain. So from zero strain to the yield strain, that area under that stress strain curve gives me my uh, modulus of 
resilience. And its units are joules per meter cubed, which is also similar to Pascal's because joules is Newton times meters. And then if I take meters divided by meters cubed, it becomes meters squared. So it becomes Newtons per meter squared. So the units look funky, but it's the same as uh, joules per meter cubed is the same as Newtons per meter squared, which is also the same as Pascal's. Now, if our elastic region is linear, which is an assumption we often make in this class, then we would say that that um, region, which is not defined by this, we could say that the modulus of resilience will be equal to the half of the um, yield stress, which will be that length, if this were linear, which is it is not in this case, and um, multiply it by the yield strain, which would be that length. And we'll do an example to crystallize this, but what you'll notice is that this dimensions here, or this formula here is very similar to half base times height. But ultimately speaking, this formula is the general formula for finding the modulus of resilience. It is the area under the stress strain curve up until the yield strain. So let's do an example that um, continues from the worksheet, worksheet that we did in class. So in class, we did uh, a few questions. We talked about the modulus of elasticity. Uh, we looked at yield strength at an offset. We looked at uh, the maximum strength a material can handle. And then we also looked at the deformation that material undergoes when it's under maximum load. So in this particular question, what we're gonna do is try to figure out the modulus of resilience at 0 .0, 0 0.002 offset using the stress strain graph that we did in class. And so like I provided to you, I gave you two different graphs and I mentioned that these two graphs are for the same material. The only difference is that this graph on the right hand side is a zoomed in version of this graph on the left, right? So you notice that this goes all the way from zero to you know a little less than 0 0.08, which will be the entire um, strain that this material undergoes before it fractures. While this, you can see the um, x-axis is much shorter to explain that again, this is um, just in this region here, okay? So it's important that when you're trying to calculate these properties that you make sure you use the right graph to get the best um, accuracy of what you're doing. So since we're going to an offset of 0 0.002, we're going to use this graph on the right-hand side. So the modulus of resilience, again, Remember, that is the amount of energy that this is a measure of the amount of energy that a material can absorb and um, release once that load is um, taken off or once that load is um, removed. Okay, So it's a measure of the load that this material can, can, can handle um, without on the, before it undergoes plastic deformation. Okay? So a high modulus of resilience would be something that you would consider to be able to take on a large amount of load um, and then release that, a, a material that has a low modulus of resilience cannot withstand a, uh, a lot of load before it um, uh, deforms. Okay, so our formula there is given again by the area, uh, the integral, right, from zero to the yield strain of the stress uh, with respect to the change in the strain. So for lack of a better term, or, or to qualify that better, we're gonna cover or look at the area under this curve up until the yield strain. So how might we do this? Well, the first thing we would like to figure out is, let's find the stress um, that this material can withstand before it plastically deforms. And so that stress that it can handle before a plastic, right before it plastically deforms, if you remember, is known as the yield strength. Okay, and we're gonna base it off of the offset of 0 0.002. So that'll be the first step that we take. The next step would be to find the strain based on this offset. So every single point on this graph is related to uh, an X value and a Y value. So if we know what the Y value is, which is our um, yield strength, okay, we will find the corresponding x value to that particular value. And sometimes this can be a little confusing because you find yourself drawing multiple lines. So I'll, I will show you how we can clarify that. But basically the strain that corresponds to this strength is known as our yield strain or epsilon y. 
And then once we find that, we have everything we need in this expression and we'll just estimate or find the area under the curve in that region, okay? And because we'll be doing some mathematical, I'll call them mathematical tricks, I guess, um, we will be getting an estimate as opposed to an actual exact value. All right, so first things first, if we're going to find the yield strength and an offset, we look for where that offset value is, which is 0 0.002. And remember, we are going to draw a line um, that is going to be parallel to this elastic region, okay? Okay, the reason being that the assumption is that once you get to that point where you plastically deform, if you take the load off, you will end up at that particular um, offset value. And again, remember the offset is just a measure of the of the amount of plastic deformation you want this material to undergo, um, or you, you feel that this material can handle, okay? So your offset sometimes might differ depending on the application that you want. So we have this offset value of uh, 0 0.002. So we're going to, you know, if you're doing this on paper, you would draw a line, right? That is parallel to this blue line. So maybe you take your straight edge, you 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 hold it across your, your paper, and then you move it all the way to 0 0.002. So when we sketch that, we'll end up with this black line. So our um, offset um, will give us our um, um, yield or our yield strength. Okay, and now your strength is going to be based on the value where this offset line crosses. So when we draw this line, we draw it all the way to our stress strain curve, and then we take that line and draw it all the way back on our y-axis. And what we notice is that sigma y corresponds to this value here, which on the y-axis is that, which then gives us a value of 1600 megapascals. Okay, so remember, you found your, you, you were given the offset value, and again, remember the reason why we have the offset is because if you were told to find where you have noticeable plastic deformation, different people are going to have different um, visualizations on the graph. So some might say, oh, it plastically deforms here, or oh, I think it plastically deforms here, or whatever, right? You're going to get some very slight, um, slightly different values. And so the offset helps us to give a general value of what that, um, a, a, a value that's consistent up, across the board. And so we find our sigma y. And then our next step is to find the strain that corresponds to this. So at this point, this point here represents both a Y value and an X value. So our X value is going to be equal. So now you can, if you're using a pencil, you can erase that offset line because we don't need it anymore once we know what our yield strength is. And then our yield strength is going to be the X axis that corresponds to that or the value on the X axis that corresponds to that, which is sigma Y. And how do we find that? Well, if you look at your graph, um, we have one, two, three, four, five subunits, and the entire unit is from zero to point zero zero two. If I were to divide point zero zero two by five, I would have point zero 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 four. So therefore, this is point zero zero eight. This is point zero zero eight four, point zero zero eight eight, nine two, nine six, one zero. So here, our sigma y is 0 0.0096, which is going to give us that. Okay, so now we're ready to roll because based on this expression, we're trying to find the area under the stress strain curve, right? From zero all the way to sigma y. So in other words, we're trying to find this area here represented by this shaded region. So that's it. That's the area we're trying to estimate because that area is going to give us our modulus of resilience. So if you were to look at this, there's a number of ways you, would, you could do it. For instance, if you're doing it on, um, say, homework or a quiz or an exam, there's, there's a quick um, way to do it. If you're doing this for a project, you would want to be more accurate. So it actually, you, know, you might do this in Excel and then um, find the area under each of these small boxes and estimate it that way. In our case, what we can do is draw a triangle that closely fits this region, which will be res represented by that blue, um, bluish uh, triangle there, okay, that shape that we see. So from what you can clearly see, the area we're trying to calculate or estimate is the one with the shaded brown lines, uh, the shaded lines or the harsh lines. The ones we are actually gonna calculate is gonna be the blue, so therefore you can see that whatever you calculate would be an underestimate of your actual value for the modulus of resilience, but it's good enough for our purposes today. So therefore, our modulus of resilience is roughly equal to the area of this blue triangle that we have here. And so 
uh, modulus of resonance, just like I said, just th this expression basically repeats that, right? It's roughly equal to the area of this triangle. And the area of a triangle, as you know, is half of the base multiplied by the height. So this base is this length, the height of the triangle is this length. So based on our graph, and if you looked at the notes from previously, our base is going to be sigma y, all right? And our height is going to, sorry, our base is going to be epsilon y, right? The yield strain. Our height is going to be sigma y, the yield strength. And then we will do the math. So we found our, our sigma y earlier. We found our epsilon y earlier. We multiply those two. We're going to get a value that's roughly 7.68 mega joules per meter cubed, okay? Remember that pascals and joules per meter cubed are similar. But your modulus of resilience is typically given in joules per meter cubed. So based on that exercise, for this material, the modulus of resilience is 7.68 uh, megajoules per meter cubed. So to summarize, if we're comparing different types of materials, I could just give you a graph and ask you to compare the difference between these materials. So for instance, if I was looking at, the, based on my stress strain information, so if I was looking at these two, types of materials, I can see that this material, for instance, can undergo a lot of strain uh, before fracture, but cannot undergo a lot of stress. I can also see that the slope in the elastic region is gentle. If I look at this material, the material, if you look at it, the strain that it undergoes before a fracture is smaller than the strain that this material undergoes. You can also see that the slope in the elastic region is steep, okay? And we can also see that the amount of stress it can handle is high, all right? So we will consider the fact that this material cannot undergo a lot of stress as making it weak, and the fact that this material can undergo a lot of stress as making it strong, okay? We see that this material here, um, in this region, the in the elastic region, the um, slope is gentle. So it has a low modulus of elasticity. So we'll say it's elastic, or we can also say it's flexible. While here, the, uh, the modulus of elasticity is large, which makes it rigid or stiff. So again, you should remember that the modulus of elasticity does not necessarily tell us how elastic it is. It tells us how resistance to, to to elasticity it is right so there's sort of a it's kind of, you can might consider it to be a misnomer but you want to remember that so a high modulus of elasticity is a material that is not elastic and a a, a um a low modulus of elasticity is a material that is elastic okay in addition if you were to look at this graph this material cannot undergo a lot of stress before in uh, a lot of strain before it fractures so we'll say that material is uh, brittle. If you had to look at this graph, this material can undergo a lot more strain before it fractures. So we can say um, that material is ductile. And then if you would look at the area under each of these curves, this has the most area. So we would say it's tough, okay, tougher than this or that. And this has more area than this does. So it's a little bit tougher. It's not as tough as this, but it's a little bit tougher um, than this material is. And so at the beginning of this class, I showed you a curve and I said that we can actually compare or think about um, our stress strain curve properties as being related to some, some, some popular athletes. So down here, we have Simone Biles and Ali Reisman who are gymnasts. And you consider them, of course, to be flexible uh, based on, you know, the floor exercises that they do and doing the splits and doing the things on the, uh, I don't know the correct terminology for it, right? But doing the things on the... Um, the horse and the bar and all those things and, and the rings uh, and and to do that you have to be really flexible to be able to handle that you also though even though you might not think about it you also have to be tough now again toughness doesn't mean strong right it, it's it's unlikely that simone biles and other guys are uh, benching you know 200 pounds or 300 pounds in, in the gym but they have to be tough because uh, gymnastics takes a lot of falling and you know you might get injured and maybe you know break a bone or or something but they kept going and so that area under that curve is one that even though it's not high it's um they can undergo a lot of strain and therefore you consider them to be tough 
the next level of athletes, Joe Thomas, uh, LeBron James, Serena Williams, they have had long careers. Um, there are people that, not everybody gets injured at some point, but over their careers, their injuries, for the most part, especially when they were younger, have been minimal. And so that career longevity is a mark of how strong they are, but also how tough they are, right? So how much they can handle quite a bit of stress, more stress um, than down here. But also, they've been able to extend their careers over time and they have um, minimal injuries. So they can have, they've been able to handle a lot of stress uh, while demonstrating a lot of an ability or capacity to be able to um, strain quite a bit on that stress as well. On the other hand, the athletes are at the top They've had um, relatively good careers. Um, they had huge potentials, but there were athletes that got injuries over time. And so you would consider them to be um, brittle in the sense that they can, you know, maybe not, they're not that strong, but they can't quite handle that much strain because that led to the injury. So, and also because, again, if you look at the area, area under this curve in comparison to the area under the green curve, you would consider them to actually um, be fragile due to the fact that they get off an injury. <clears throat> okay. So those are mechanical properties. So some of the mechanical properties are going to get from stress strain curves. Um, in the beginning we, of this class, I mentioned that our engineering stress and engineering strain are always based on the original area. But from what we know, when we apply a load to a material, that material's um, dimensions are going to change as well. So that gives us an opportunity to actually be able to define the stress and strain with respect to these new dimensions that the material is experiencing. Because as you apply the stress to your material, um, your area is going to change. So the more load you apply, um, the more um, the material lengthens, but also the more the cross section changes. So if you remember, we said once we pass this maximum um, value of stress, we start to get what is known as necking. And so the properties that measure load and deformation with respect to the change in dimension, those are called true stress and true strain. So your true stress, sigma t, is related to the load divided by the instantaneous area, so the area at that instant. Okay, so that area at that instance, the only time it's equal to the original is when you have no load. Once you apply a load, that number starts to change. And the true strain is a relationship between your original length and your instantaneous length uh, based on a combination of our um, natural log. So if you notice the difference between this and um, engineering strain is that this was a delta, um, delta L, initial, L instantaneous minus L0, while for um, true strain is a natural log um, relationship. And so if we were to assume, for instance, that our volume stays constant, which is that area times length in the instant is equal to the area times length originally, then our true stress and true strain can be related back to our engineering stress and engineering strain based on these two relationships. Okay, so that's an assumption we can make. And if we make that assumption, then we can actually back calculate and convert these expressions um, and relate them to these new expressions as well. And again, all of that is based on, on the fact that I can solve this expression for A0, for instance, which is what I'll have on the base here for my engineering stress. And um, similarly, I can solve this for Li, um, and I can convert this and simplify this. So sigma is your engineering strain. Sorry, I keep... Uh, Mixing those two. Epsilon is our engineering strain. Sigma is our engineering stress. Sigma T is our true stress. Epsilon T is our true strain. And these true values are mostly used um, more for experimental um, things that you might do in the lab. At scale, or when we design um, um, materials, we focus really on the engineering stress and strain value as opposed to the true stress and true strain. But the true stress and true strain basically give us a sense of how the geometry actually changes in relation to our um, material. And so you can see that this, this graph keeps on going higher and higher because basically this number here gets much, much smaller. All right, so now all we've talked about so far are mainly due to metals. Um, we will now look at how these dimensions slightly change for ceramics and for polymers.
Um, ceramics are materials that are defined as uh, as being brittle. That was again one of the first properties you we we talked about in the introduction to the class, even before you knew what the the brittle meant. But if you recall, brittle means it's the opposite of ductility, and ductility is how far out our stress strain graph goes. So for a material that's brittle, the stress strain graph is not going to stretch out as much before the material fractures. And you will notice if you were to look at these values here, you can see these values are really, really small, right? If I had to multiply this by 100, this is basically a strain of 0.04%. This is a strain of 0.08%, right? Because our ceramics uh, materials cannot undergo that much um, deformation before they fracture. So way, way back, I talked about how we talked about how ceramics have um, mostly have positive and negative charges. And as soon as you um, apply a force to that or a load, your positive and negative charges, which were alternating previously, now start to get close together and you're going to get repulsion between your positive and negative and that cancels out and your material fractures. And so these materials can undergo um, um, almost no deformation. They, they can, they can, you can get a little bit, but almost none before they actually fracture. This is also the reason why um, the yield strength of ceramic values are hard to measure or hard to measure or get repeated measurements for because um, like I said there's almost no reasonable or visible um, plastic deformation before that happens. Ceramics also tend to have a lot of pores right and your pores are regions where there is no material so if I have a lot more pores I have less material that I'm applying my load to and basically you will notice that as your porosity increases right your uh, measure of your modulus of elasticity or stiffness um, decreases as well because if you were to imagine um, let's say we look at a rubber band for instance and you take a rubber band and you put a huge hole in it right if you had to try to pull that apart when there is no hole and when there's a hole you're going to see vastly different relationships basically these these uh, porosities are a measure of how much space i have so as i have more and more space my um, stiffness of my material drops significantly, which is something you have to worry about when you design um, these materials. So as much as possible when we make ceramic, ceramic materials, if we want them to have good mechanical properties, we have to find a way to reduce the amount of pores that are present in them, otherwise they won't hold up. So for polymers, we can consider um, different kinds of polymers. So we've talked about um, Thermosets and thermoplasts when we talk about the uh, structure of polymers. Um, our thermosets are the ones that you cannot reshape once they ha are, um, once they are plastically deformed, right? So once you've, you've given that material a permanent shape, if you heat it up, you can't reshape it again, like a button or like a pool ball, for instance, they're, they're already set, right? Well, if you keep on heating them up, all they will do is just burn and you're breaking down the material. On the other hand, we have thermoplasts, which are materials that you can actually, once you plastically deform them, if you heat them back up, they can soften and be reshaped into new materials. And then the last one are elastomers, which are usually things like, um, things that are made of rubber. Okay, so a rubber band, for instance. Um, and so if you were to look at this, your thermosets behave um, similar to how brittle metals behave, right? They cannot undergo a lot of um, strain before they fracture. So they they might they will be able to handle quite a bit of stress. So again, if you think about a pool ball and how hard it is, or how much um, <laughs> if it were to hit you, how much it hurts, right? Um, so they can actually handle quite a bit of load before they fracture, but they undergo almost no significant or visible um, strain. Your elastomers, like your rubber, rubber bands, are the opposite. They can handle quite, they can deform very well before they fracture, but they can't handle um, that much um, strain. <clears throat> Sorry, that much stress, okay, before they fracture. So you would consider your elastomers as being weak, but very ductile. Your thermosets are um, very strong in comparison, but... Um, can handle but very brittle okay and also if you were to look at this strain curve these are large percentages basically what this is saying for instance for this graph is that the material can undergo 700 percent 
deformation before it fractures, which is huge, right? Our um, thermoset, on the other hand, can undergo, I mean, let's, we can roughly say this is maybe 20%, roughly speaking. Um, so the fracture strengths are also very small. So if you look at this and compare it to metals, we're in the 60 megapascals range here. Well, if you think about the problem that we did earlier, we were upwards of, um, you know, 20,000 uh, megapascals. But you can see that some of them can undergo much longer strains than your typical metals would. And then your thermoplasts are somewhere in between, right? They can undergo um, quite a bit of um, stress or intermediate amount of stress and then um, an intermediate amount of strain in comparison to the other two types of plastics or the other two types of polymers. Just like your metals, you also have the temperature effect, um, especially with respect to thermoplastics, right? Because I said that for thermoplasts, you can reshape them. And again, if we were to think about what's happening at the atomic level, when you apply heat or or for to bring it back a little bit, let's say you, when you increase temperature, what you're doing is you're giving energy to your atoms. And if you're giving energy to your atoms, they're free to move around. So the bonds that were static previously, the bonds between them start to weaken because now they're free to move around. On the other hand, if the bonds were really strong, the atoms won't move around that much. They have very, very little wiggle room. So as these things are moving around much more, their bonds weaken, and because their bonds become weaker, you can reshape them easier. Okay. So what you will notice here is that as my temperature increases, so if I go from 4 degrees Celsius here to 60 degrees Celsius, the material goes from behaving almost like a thermoset to behaving more like an elastomer, right? What's happening? Well, your material is becoming is going from being very stiff, stiff or rigid to being very um, elastic or flexible, right? You can see basically that this region there, the elastic region, the slope starts to decrease. Um, the slope is really high here. The slope is small here. But what you also notice that is that the maximum value for your stress is also decreasing as well, which means that this material is becoming weaker and you also notice that the length or the amount of strain it can undergo is becoming large long, more and more which means the material is also becoming more ductile so as i increase my temperature right my elastic modulus goes down my tensile strength goes down my ductility goes up conversely as it says here as i decrease my temperature from 60 degrees to 4 degrees celsius these are the phenomena that I will see. <clears throat> Last concept we'll talk about is hardness. Hardness defines the resistance of a material to plastic deformation. So again, if you recall, plastic deformation is related to a permanence in the change in the dimensions of that material. Okay, so if something is hard, it resists that change in dimension, okay? And so you can think of the fact that your your hardness is actually correlated to your strength, okay? Uh, specifically your tensile strength. And so if we had a look at this, the way you could measure that, and, and, and there are some qualitative methods like what is known as a scratch test, where basically you scratch two pieces of material with the same, um, 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 with the same material. So maybe I take, I have a, a for instance, a glass on a metal, right? I might take a piece of diamond and scratch both surfaces and measure how deep that cut goes. And the deeper it goes, um, that means that that material is not that resistant to uh, plastic deformation. Or the deeper it goes, the softer the material is. And so usually the way this is measured is by taking a uh, material of a known dimension, okay? And correlating the dimension of that material to the dimension of the indentation that is made. And again, in both cases, you apply a known force. So if we look at this qualitatively, we would say that as you go from plastics to diamond, your um, your uh, hardness increases. Okay, And so there are multiple different ways in which hardness can be correlated. There's the Brinell test, there's the Vickers test, there's the Noob test. And the main difference between them are the dimensions of the material that is doing the indentation. Okay. So just to go back a little bit, if I were to take two materials and in this material, I get a D of this dimension and in the other material, I get a D of a much larger dimension. That tells me that this with the smaller D 
is harder than the one with the larger D. And ultimately speaking, you can correlate your hardness back to your tensile strength by using some um, correlation value. But the main thing to understand is that if a material is, is strong, it's going to be hard. If a material is weak, it's going to be soft. <clears throat> the last thing I'll talk about is what is known as a safety factor. So recall that all these hardness tests and strength tests, all of them are done in the lab. Um, using materials that are made or synthesized. And so to get those values that we measure, we have to do a variety of tests, right? We do a bunch of different tests, and then we can measure uh, what the average value that we have and what the, the, the spread in those values are, right? So your standard deviation gives you a measure of how far you are from the average, right? If we have a lot of variation, the standard deviation is going to be large. If we don't have that much variation, the standard deviation is going to be smaller. So, uh, so to account for the fact that we have this variability in our measurements, when we design parts, we include what is known as a safety factor, okay? The safety factor gives us, allows us to um, give some forgiveness to the final part we're going to make, okay? So let's think about this in this manner. If we make our safety factor really large, Okay, if our safety factor is really high, right? Then what we're doing is saying that our material, um, we don't want our material to, or it's going to take quite a lot for our material to fail. Okay, if our safety factor is small, it's going to take um, very little for our material to fail. So when you're thinking about designing, and, and again, I'll show you this um, using expressions. So the extra relationship. And typically, when, we, when, when you design for mechanical properties, you design based on the yield strength. And the reason why you're designing based on the yield strength, again, is because the yield strength is when the material plastically deforms. So that material is permanently, um, the dimensions are permanently changed. And so if you were to design for um, a certain part, you want to think about, well, when might that material undergo? Because once you start to get deformation, you can't reverse that effect, right? And so if you were to look at this value here, what we designed for is um, what is known as the working um, stress, okay? And what we might measure in the lab is the yield stress. So if this number is small, the whole thing is going to be large. If this number or your uh, denominator is large, right, this whole thing will be small, okay? So what does that mean? Well, if this whole number is large, that means we're de designing for um, a large yield strength, okay? If this number, this whole expression is small, that means we're designing for a small yield strength. And recall that your, your stress is related indirectly or indirectly proportional to your area okay so if, in a manner of speaking you can almost think of like your your safety factor and your area to be directly related so if my safety factor is large the cross-section of my area of my material is going to be large if my safety factor is small the cross-sectional area of my material is going to be small so speaking a different way if my safety factor is small then what that means is that the dimensions of my material are going to be smaller than they need to be. And that would be inherently unsafe because now your cross-sectional area is being designed not to handle a lot of stress. If my safety factor is large, then my area is going to be really large. And now, it, which is good for design in the sense that it's going to take quite a bit for it to fill, but you might also be over-designing and using more material than you need. So there is sort of a sweet spot that you would need to get to. Um, to consider the fact that you want to make sure the materials are safe as possible, but also, you know, um, not as expensive. It, it doesn't have to be more expensive than it needs to be. Um, and that's how you would correlate that. And there's, there's a question on your homework to more solidify um, this concept. But with that, we will be, we're done with chapter seven. Uh, we covered some things in the second part of the lecture that were not covered in the first part. But with this information, um, you have um, enough to you know, do some of the problems that you have and um, I will see you in class.
next time.